Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever found something really important to you that had been lost? If you have, you're probably familiar with the feeling that Jesus is describing that God has in our gospel reading. When you lose something really important, no one has to tell you to look for it. You search for it immediately. You almost can't think of anything else until it is found. Maybe the Steelers game is about to be on and you lost your TV remote. Everything immediately driven from your mind until you find the remote so you can turn on the TV. Or maybe, as one of the kids pointed out, And it wasn't coordinated, I promise. You lost your homework. Or maybe a work project. Maybe you lost the physical copy or it's lost somewhere on your computer and you can't find it and it needs to be turned in. Searching frantically. Or maybe some of you have had the situation where you've lost a pet. Maybe permanently, maybe temporarily. I can remember a time when I was younger, I was going to visit my cousins, and I opened the front door of their house, and their dog just shot out the front door before anyone could do anything about it. And what did we spend the next two hours doing? Searching for the dog. And nobody questioned it. Nobody said, do we really have to? Because you really wanted the dog back. More recently, my wife and I went camping, and we took our dog Tucker with us, and my dog is... He's pretty easygoing. He doesn't chase after things. But while they weren't paying attention, he just slowly wandered off. And we looked around and we couldn't find him. And we couldn't find him for about 10 minutes. And during those 10 minutes, which seemed way longer than 10 minutes, I wasn't thinking about anything other than wondering where my dog was at and wanting to find him. Fortunately, we did. And perhaps the ultimate example that I alluded to in the children's message, losing a person, losing a child, or any person really. No one has to tell you to go find them. You want to find them because you love them and you're afraid for what might happen to them. And you don't stop until you get answers, until you find them. But notice in our gospel reading today, Jesus isn't focusing on the fear of what's lost. But rather, he's focusing on the joy of what happens when you find and rescue that which is lost. Now, imagine all of those other situations I just gave you. You really are joyful when those things are found. Different degrees of joy, maybe. Remote is a little less important than a person or a pet. But even more than the person being lost and found... Jesus is teaching us today that God is more joyful when a sinner repents and is found and is rescued by Jesus, even more joyful than that. That's a pretty radical thing to say, because the lost ones in our scripture reading aren't people who just, you can't see The lost ones are those who have actively wandered away from God, their good shepherd. And Jesus is teaching and telling the tax collectors, sinners, and Pharisees that the way God feels about that situation is that he wants to find them so much that he goes and searches for them and leaves the others behind. That's how God feels when we turn away from our sin at the behest of his word, when Jesus does his work in our lives and in our hearts and redeems us as his children, that's just how much God loves you. So let's get some context for this teaching. We had a little detour to David and Goliath last week, but before that, The sermon was about table fellowship, and this is really what this is about as well. This is the culmination of a few chapters of Luke's gospel where Jesus is teaching about who God wants to associate, where he's going to bring them, 
and what exactly you have to do to be invited. Because the religious community of the day isn't quite in line with God's picture of who comes to his table. You can recall that the image two weeks ago was that you've been invited to a banquet you have no business being at. Nothing made you worthy of going there other than the invitation of the host. So Jesus is reaching the high point in his teaching about this table fellowship stuff. And he's really answering the question for those who are listening, both for the grumbling Pharisees and for the tax collectors and sinners who were told at the beginning of our gospel reading are drawing near to Jesus to hear what he has to say. Does he really mean that God's Messiah has come to associate with sinners? Now, the Pharisees already have their feelings made known early on in our text today about how they feel about God's idea because they're grumbling about that specific thing. They say, this man receives sinners and eats with them, scandalized by this teaching of Jesus. Because remember, in this day and age, and really still today, table fellowship implies an intimacy and acceptance of the one invited to the table who you're sharing the meal with. So this comment, this grumbling of the Pharisees, sparks two parables in our reading today, but three in total. In response to that grumbling, Jesus teaches a few things. And in each one, something is lost, Then it's searched out and found and rescued and then returned to where it belongs with great joy. And the joy is not limited to the rescuer and the person being rescued, but it's a joy that spreads to the whole community of people. So the lost sheep we're going to focus more on than the lost coin because the lost sheep has more detail, but they're both pointing to the same truth, that God does indeed love sinners. And not just a love that's distant and affectionate, but one that causes him to seek them out, to save them and bring them where they belong in his house. And he does that joyfully because of his love for the lost ones. So he uses an image that everybody would relate to, a sheep and a shepherd. They all know what that is. And maybe the Pharisees are bristling at the imagery, but they all know what it means. So what does any shepherd, any shepherd worth his salt, do when one of his sheep wanders off? Everybody knows the job of the shepherd is to protect the sheep, to provide for them, to keep them together. And so if one of the sheep wanders off and gets lost, what does the shepherd do? He seeks it out, seeks out the sheep to go find it. Now, we have heard this story a bunch of times, and so our minds are already working at knowing who's what part of the story and who might be the other part of the story. But at this point, nobody who's listening to Jesus has any idea which part they're playing in what he's describing. Are they the sheep that's wandered off? Are they one of the 99 righteous sheep who did what they were supposed to do and listened to the shepherd and didn't wander off like that idiot over there? Are they the shepherd? who's responsible for carrying the sheep and has let a sheep wander off under their watch? Let's find out. The sheep that is lost is afraid. And when sheep are afraid, do you know what they do? Nothing. They freeze up and they stop moving. In fact, even when the shepherd finds them, they won't start moving. Notice that Luke takes particular detail in describing the rescuing interaction. And here's what he says. And when he has found it, the lost sheep, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So he has to pick the sheep up, and sheep aren't tiny animals, and put it on his shoulders and carry it because it's so afraid that it can't move. And Luke chooses this imagery intentionally because the shepherd is placing the burden of the sheep upon himself as part of what is needed to bring it home, to rescue it, because it's unable to do those things itself. He very intentionally doesn't say that the shepherd speaks to the sheep and the sheep's like, oh, here's the shepherd. Yeah, I'll follow you. The sheep can't even do that. The sheep needs to be rescued 
completely and utterly. Echoing from a couple weeks ago, if you think that you have a reason other than Jesus that you're here, you're wrong. We're like we are that sheep, huddled and afraid, frozen in fear, incapable of doing a thing. So the shepherd, in this case Christ, he must bear the burden of the sheep as part of the rescue. And we picked up a little bit of that in our Old Testament reading. Notice that all of the verbal things that are being done to the flock are being done by God. I myself will tend to my sheep. I myself will seek them out and find them. I myself will tend to them. Have you figured out who you are yet? Well, the answer to that might be a little trickier than you think. See, in, in, uh, in Lutheran teaching, we believe that the Scripture teaches two primary things, law and gospel. And this is a beautiful example of that because Luke gives us the audience that Jesus is speaking to, and I can guarantee you the audience is hearing this same message in different ways. One in a gospel way and one in a law way, because both are present here. So how do you think those who are listening to Jesus, who are the tax collectors and sinners, are hearing what Jesus has to say? They're the group of people that have never been invited to important banquets, that are treated poorly by those around them, that are viewed as unworthy or unclean, as sinful. They're excluded. How do you think they're hearing a message from Jesus, the Messiah of God, that God actually is coming for them? You think that's a law message for them or a gospel message? A message about the glorious love of God in Jesus they pretty quickly are going to identify with the lost sheep. But how do you think the Pharisees are hearing the story? A reaction told in, uh, told in reaction to the grumbling that they had against the tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is clearly speaking these parables against what they've said and done. It's heard as the law. The law kills the self-righteous man inside of us, the old Adam, who doesn't want to hear what Jesus has to say, who wants to do things his own way. So they're probably hearing accusations about being the shepherd who's lost a sheep on their watch, or their accusations about whether or not there are actually any righteous sheep to begin with, because Jesus doesn't seem to focus too much on those. Well, how do you hear this parable this morning. I think if we're being honest, probably it's a bit of both. Because we all have a bit of each member of the audience in ourselves. Now, it may be more than others today. Maybe you are downtrodden and the law has sort of crushed your self-reliance through the normal workings of your life, failing to live up to your own expectations. And you hear the gospel here, as you should. It's there for you. To remind you that in those moments where you think you're unworthy and unloved, it's untrue. God does love you. And He doesn't love you because you're worthy or unworthy, but He just does. So much so that He seeks you out and rescues you. So hear the words of Jesus today with joy. For you are loved by God, and He has rescued you from all your sins. And He's bringing you to your rightful place, His home, with Him. But maybe today you're feeling a little righteous, yeah? Feeling like, ah, you know, I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. I don't, you know, my, nothing really came to mind when we were doing the confession of sins today. I think I had a pretty good track record this week. I'm not like that guy over there. He's wandered off, clearly. But I'm right where I need to be, right, Jesus? Maybe not. If you thought to yourself that you're a good person deserving of the praise that you receive, deserving of being here in the presence of God, hear the words of Jesus and know that no one is righteous, not even one, not even the Pharisees. Jesus is telling us to, to call them to repentance to stop relying on themselves and their own righteousness, which isn't even there, 
by through His Word revealing to them the truth of their situation, that they too are lost and in need of the Good Shepherd. That's the beauty of this message, is that even if you're the self-righteous one who's lost track, when we're humbled by the law and the rebuke of Jesus, Right there waiting for us is the truth of the gospel. Yes, you're a sinner. Yes, you are a lost one. But I came for those. I love them. I will rescue them and bring them home with me. So you too can hear the words today with joy. The joy of one who knows that they are rescued from the great love of Jesus. So who are you? You're the lost one, whether you're the tax collector or the sinner or the Pharisee. Yet rejoice. We aren't gathered in sorrow and despair, but in joy because we have been found. You have been found by your good shepherd, Jesus. He loves you so much that He doesn't leave you in fear. He bears your burden of sin. He lifts you onto His shoulders joyously, right? It says that as he's doing that, he's doing it rejoicing. I can't even understand the depth of love that requires. Yet God has that for each and every one of you. And he's bringing you home. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem as he's teaching this. He knows where he's going. He knows what needs to be done. And the text is telling us that He's doing that joyfully because of how much He loves you. It's no accident that each of these parables ends with a party. That's the goal, right? We're getting a little foretaste of that today, every Sunday when we gather and receive the gifts of God. Right? One of the names that people have for communion is a foretaste of the feast to come. We're a people that are looking forward to a great big party, a party that never ends a party suffused by joy, rooted in the mercy and love of Jesus. So today, dear friends in Christ, we gather in joy, in celebration, not of anything we've done, but of what Jesus has done for us. We have no business being here apart from Christ and His love, and it is yours. He is your good shepherd. You are no longer lost you've been found. So every Sunday we gather in joy, but today on our rally day we're celebrating in particular one of the gifts that Jesus has given the church, God's Word. The very same Word that illumined the context of our real situation, that in fact we're not one of those righteous sheep, we're one of the lost ones, so afraid we can't move, we can't do anything. But Jesus comes along and scoops us up. That's what the Word is revealing to us today, and it's going to reveal that to you every Sunday until Jesus returns. That's the great joy that He brings. Jesus, the Word made flesh, came to dwell among you. He sought you out. He revealed the truth of God to you. Yes, you are a self-righteous sinner. But I have good news. I didn't find you by accident. I came for sinners. I love sinners. I redeem and rescue sinners. I place them joyfully on my shoulders and bring them home. So, dear saints of Ascension, this is why we celebrate today the gift of God's Word. This is why we're honoring and praying and blessing our teachers in our congregation who bring that Word to bear in Bible class and in small groups, because we recognize it for what it is, a gift. Today we began the service with a prayer, which is a collect for grace to receive the Word, because as disciples we're called to hear it, read it, mark it, learn it, and inwardly digest it, for it is the source of our new life of faith in Christ. So I'm urging you to be in the Word as much as you can. If you're a member here who doesn't go to a Bible study, go to one. Go to one. 
whether it's on Sunday or during the week, go to a Bible study. And I'm not urging you to do that in a legalistic way. Because, right, the sheep can't do anything. They need the shepherd. But it is this great divine treasure that Jesus wants you to have. That's why he came to bring it. So I urge you to receive this gift from Jesus. Because it is that very same word that is revealed to each of us today. That yes, you're a sinner. But God loves sinners so much that he sent Jesus. And Jesus has found you, joyously put you on his shoulders, redeemed, loved, and brought home where you belong, with him forever. Amen.